Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to all the competitors and all the visitors that were here uh, last weekend for the zone competitions. Uh, welcome to the Saskatchewan Provincial Effective Speaking Competition. My name is Jay Shaw. I will be your MC today. Uh, I'm a current director for the Air Cadet League and a former competitor at this effective speaking competition. I actually participated in provincials in 2016, 17, and 18, and participated in nationals in 17 and 18. Um, so today we have six competitors, three from each zone competition that was held last weekend. It's the top three winners. And the winner of this competition will move on to nationals. Uh, just like last time, before we start, I'll just go through a few housekeeping rules. Uh, so number one, please remain muted during this competition, unless you're the speaker, of course. Uh, number two, I'd like to remind everyone that there's no photographs or screenshots uh, during the competition. I will be recording this competition and posting it on our uh, Facebook and YouTube page afterwards. Um, and at the end, we'll take a few screenshots with the cadets, all the competitors. Um, for the parents, uh, please make sure your video is off. Um, and once the speeches begin, please don't switch uh, mid-speech. Uh, for those entering late, or if you need to enter the Zoom call again uh, for any reason, you might be waiting a few minutes just because we'll be only allowing uh, people in uh, before or after speeches instead of mid-speech. And lastly, I think all the visitors have done this, but if you haven't, please enter a V in front of your name on Zoom. Just rename yourself so that we can alphabetically sort everyone so we know who's here. Um, just like last time, I'll also go through the format for this competition. Uh, in case you forgot, or if you're a visitor who hasn't attended this, attended this competition before, uh, or maybe you just like listening to what I have to say. <laughs> so uh, this competition will be two speeches. The first will be a prepared speech, which will be five to six minutes long. Then we'll have a short break, and then we'll start the impromptu speeches. So for that, the cadets will be isolated. They'll be sent into a separate breakout room. And when it's their time, they'll be sent into a different breakout room to start their three minute preparation time. And then they'll be moved into this main session to give a two to three minute speech. Uh, the order of the cadets corresponds to their speaker number. And for the impromptu speeches in the second half of this competition, it'll be reversed. So for the judges, speaker number six will go first for the impromptu speeches. Any questions from any cadets or judges or parents? Before we begin, you can just, I think, raise your hand or something. Uh, okay, seeing none, Michelle, I think we're ready to start our prepared speeching, speaking uh, portion of this competition. All right. Okay, so we have speaker number one, and topic will be cadet choice, science and technology specifically Canadian innovations in World War I. Canadian innovations in World War I, speaker number one. The draft in World War I meant that Canadians from all different backgrounds were sent to Europe. Many of them were tradesmen or engineers, and they took their knowledge and skills with them to the war. But how useful could these skills actually be in a military context? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please sit back and enjoy while I tell you some incredible stories about Canadians took what they knew and used it to support the Allies in their fight to win the war. Our first story takes us to the battlefields of the Western Front in France. Constant shelling had become a staple of World War I life. Lieutenant Colonel Andrew McNaughton, an engineering professor at McGill University, decided to try and find a way to fix this problem. He de developed the technique called scientific gunnery. Since the beginning of warfare, artillery has been based mostly on two main things, angle and force. Basically, at what angle are you shooting the projectile and how much force are you putting behind the projectile? However, by the 20th century, the Allies were shooting shells farther and more often than ever before. <clears throat> McNaughton's new technique took into account meteorological conditions, and barrel wear when aiming artillery. Along with these new techniques, McNaught used flash spotting and sound ranging to determine the position of enemy artillery. 
this meant that the Allies could better protect its soldiers <clears throat> for, and was able to fire back at the enemy artillery, giving them a break from the constant bombardments that had become a staple of World War I life, even if for just a couple minutes. Scientific gunnery was used throughout the war, including at Vimy Ridge, and saw great success. The Canadian War Museum calls McNaughton one of the leading gunners of the war. He is an exceptional example of how Canadians use their knowledge and skills from civil life to improve the Canadian military's tactics and strategies to better protect its soldiers in the trenches. Now, I want to take you to the Gallipoli Peninsula of Turkey, jutting out into the Aegean Sea. In Gallipoli, the Allies were worried that the Germans would use poison gas just like they had on the Western Front. After serving in France, Belgium, and Egypt, Dr. Cludy McPherson of the Newfoundland Regiment was sent to Gallipoli to serve as an advisor on poison gas. He was perfect for the job because of his studies in medicine at the Methodist College in St. John's and at McGill University. In an attempt to fight back against the poison gas attacks, McPherson took a German helmet and fashioned a canvas hood with transparent eyepieces that he then treated with chlorine absorbing chemicals. McPherson had just created the world's first gas mask. It was a massive breakthrough for the Allies, who previously had no way of combating against poison gas, except for to, for, for to just run away. His concept is now used by millions of troops all around the world and has saved countless lives. The last story I'd like to tell you about today is the story of the Composite Pioneer Company. During the First World War, they didn't have the planes or helicopters of modern militaries. If the Allies wanted to transport a large number of people or equipment, they needed to use railways. Unfortunately, railways still had many issues. Once you built one, if you wanted to go somewhere else, you had to build an entirely new railway track. Also, they were very easily destroyed by enemy artillery and took a long time to rebuild. This prompted the development of the light railway system that could be quickly built when all rail railways were destroyed or when you wanted to build a new track going somewhere else. The Canadian Corps had a unique advantage when it came to adopting the light railway system because Canada was a young country who had just built a massive railway system of its own back at home. In April 1916, the Canadians organized the Composite Pioneer Company, made mostly of experienced railway workers from Canada, to focus just on the light railway system. After six months of working, they had increased the length of the railway line by four times. Over a seven day period in 1917, they transported over 38,000 tons of munitions. That's equal to 19,000 elephants, a truly incredible feat. These stories of the Composite Pioneer Company, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew McNaughton and Dr. Clooney McPherson are all examples of Canadians applying their peacetime expertise to military problems in the extreme challenges of war. This has left a legacy of innovation and advancement that lives on to today. The most impressive part of all of these stories, at least to me, is that they show how effectively Canadians took what they knew and used it to protect their friends, family, and fellow Canadians. I can only imagine how great our world would be if every one of us took our skills and focused just a little bit of that knowledge into making a difference in society. As you leave this competition today, I would like you to ask yourself this, how can I use my skills to make a difference in the world? Thanks, speaker number one. Thank you. Okay, now we'll just have a few minutes for the three judges to finish marking. And for the judges, if you could just send me a chat message or a thumbs up so we know you're done. Speaker number two, are you ready? Uh, yes, if I could just have a second to pin the time, sure. paper, please. Okay. Okay, now we have speaker number two. Topic is, what have you learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? What have you learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? Speaker number two.
I spent weeks around my laptop, waiting for news. It came finally on a Monday morning, and it came the way everything comes these days, as a text message. Grades are up. I knew all my other marks, and I had never failed a course, so how bad could it be? Statics. That's how bad. Good afternoon, honorable judges, officers, cadets, and guests. I'm Warren Officer First Class Catherine Batani with 542 Foam Lake. What have I learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? Many things, like how to sanitize my groceries. Yet the most important lesson has been remaining in motion during a pandemic that seems to freeze time. Because of COVID-19, my first year of engineering has been completely online. Our lectures are pre-recorded videos and textbook pages. We are safe behind our screens, but isolated because of them. I can't ask a question to others in a lecture or study in the library with friends. Engineering takes pride in unity, but we don't know how to react when we are divided by distance. Statics is a required engineering course. It is a part of mechanics that uses bodies at rest and forces in equilibrium. So basically, it's about things not moving, being static. Coincidentally, this COVID year has been nothing but a standstill. I spent many late nights trying to understand what to do with one single question. Many of my assignments came back with 50s, 40s, and the occasional zero, but I didn't stop. I pushed myself to ask so many questions. The final exam day crept up. It was designed to take five hours, but had a limit of three. And when that time was up, I grasped onto my last bit of hope and hugged my mom and cried. So I spent three weeks just waiting for news. Finally, the grades were posted. I had never failed a course until right now. A soul-crushing 43. We learn in grade school that failure is the key to success. But have you ever had to sit in the pieces of your mistake? It doesn't feel like an achievement. At the time, I wanted to freeze, but I had to continue on. I spoke to friends, family, and neighbors. I learned that it wasn't uncommon to fail. I felt relief. I took statics again this semester. It was a challenge with more late nights. I finished in March. I sat perfectly motionless as the loading dots spun around, fetching my grades. All my frustration had come down to this. My student page and at the very bottom, statics. My finish line was finally there. Statics, D minus. I had passed, <laughs> I made it, but with a 52. It's not a good mark. I thought, did it even matter? It took me a while to accept, but I've realized that it does matter, and it matters very much. We're often faced with disasters, frustrations, like a pandemic, online university, failure. But it's always our choice how we react. I am proud I made progress forward. I've decided to try something different from engineering. Although I did pass, I didn't think it was worth it. Those stressful days and sleepless nights took their toll on my mental health, and I'd rather do something challenging and enjoyable. It taught me I am strong, and I'm following a new passion with plans to one day work in a library. I was just accepted into my new program. I love books, and I want to share my love of literature and storytelling with others. I am so excited. This is my progress forward. So what have I learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? That I never considered myself an overly social person, but when I spent a lot of time isolated by distance, I realized having people who understand what I'm going through is very valuable to me. Engineering is hard. A program where togetherness propels students forward, but we lost that because of COVID-19 which made a very difficult program that much harder. Finally, I learned to not be static. The pandemic has forced me to be stuck in many ways, at home, without fellow students, but I found to look for ways to be mobile, even with restrictions. 
it has taught me that I am very resilient. All of the challenges will fade, but one thing won't. When I told my mom I had passed, she said, I'm proud of you. That was really good. And when I knew I was proud of me, I had made it. And now I'm on to something different. Thanks, speaker number two. Now we'll just give the judges a few minutes. Speaker three, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, we have speaker number three. What have you learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? What have you learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? Speaker number three. A whirlwind of negativity engulfs 2020. When things do not go as expected, we as humans tend to quickly panic, throwing blame and projecting our own guilt onto others. But personally, I find that change, while challenging, is just a test that I have to strive to overcome on my own. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Flight Sergeant Guan from 41 Hercules Squadron, and today I'll be sharing what I've discovered from the COVID-19 pandemic. To start, I was given this time as an opportunity to rest, heal, and start from scratch. As a person that is involved in countless extracurricular activities, I learned that taking a break for myself was essential to growing into a strong, independent, stable woman during a time filled with such uncertainty. I grieved for everything that was gone, but also found new things every day that made these unusual times worth living. Filling my days with my family and activities like long nature walks, running, and playing music have made this lonely life endurable. I learned not to worry about things I can't control and to spend effort on things I can actually do, contribute to, or influence. I learned that there's still ways to connect and make an in impact in the community. COVID-19 surprisingly had ignited my passion into a reality with the mindset of, if not now, then when? Initially being afraid to start a project completely on my own was just a testament that I have to get out of my comfort zone to positively impact my community in a time like this. As a passionate musician playing five different instruments, I noticed the lack of musical opportunities for youth in my community. I took the initiative by creating a free accessible music program for grades three to eight on the fundamentals of reading music in 2020. I made exciting, engaging classes by incorporating all styles of learning, kinetic by making musical instruments, visual by incorporating pictures to better understand the lesson, and auditory by creating your own rhythm to listen to the musical concepts. I was able to utilize technology to provide these lessons during the pandemic. And I successfully taught the fundamentals of reading music to seven students. My leadership educated youth in my community and fostered accessibility. Taking a leap of courage has shaped me into a confident, resilient individual ready to tackle bigger issues. And honestly, if it wasn't for COVID, I would not be bold enough to do something completely on my own. But through this pandemic, I learned to take action now as we just don't know what the future or even tomorrow will bring. I learned that making a difference is not rocket science. It can be simply delivering groceries to vulnerable members of the community which can create lasting relationships and a positive impact within the community. The most important lesson I've learned from the pandemic is how valuable technology can serve us. If it were not for technology, I would not have the opportunity to speak here today, connect with friends and family across the world, or have the chance to make a virtual music program, or even continue cadets. I've been able to foster relationships with people I made across the world by participating in global youth conferences, virtual exchanges through Ex Exchange Canada, and an entrepreneurship camp where my team and I are launching a startup to connect fitness trainers to high school students to motivate them to reach their health goals. Positively using technology has allowed me to network with industry professionals and receive valuable advice as I move into adulthood and into higher education. Being able to hear different perspectives from mentors has inspired me to become the best version of myself. And through technology, I've been positively impacted by my mentors and in return, impacting youth 
and high school students in my virtual community. Lastly, I learned how critical it is for everyone to do their part. Just like battling this pandemic, we all have to do our part to overcome racism. We have a lot to overcome, but it is not too late. The inequality disadvantaged groups face day to day has to end. And this starts with you, me and our family and friends. Acknowledging the many forms of racism, supporting others and educating ourselves and others to commit to anti-racism is essential to fight the inequalities minorities face in the workforce, school, media, shops, or even walking in public. We need to strive for equality for our family and friends to get to where we all need to be. And no, like most people, this journey was not easy. There were many hard days and tears shed. What I thought would be weeks turned into months, now over a year into battling this pandemic. This year is not over, this pandemic is not over, and my life is not over. I have so much more to grow and discover about myself, but through the pandemic, I've learned that overcoming obstacles is a part of life, and that taking a break from myself is necessary. And with technology, I can take initiative to positively impact the community, and that by uniting together, we can accomplish something bigger. Thank you, speaker number three. Thank you. Now we'll just give the judges a few minutes to mark. Speaker four, are you ready? <clears throat> yep. Okay, we have speaker number four. Topic is cadet choice, science and technology. Science and technology, speaker number four. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, and esteemed judges. I am Warrant Officer Second Class Brett Rowan of the 186 Air Cadet Squadron. And today I would like to talk to you about a relatively new technology and its effect on the technology of the world and the environment we live in now and into the future. Bitcoin is a technology that many people have heard of, but few understand. A relatively new internet currency, a marvel of computer programming today. But how did Bitcoin get its start? The creation of Bitcoin is shrouded in mystery, mainly centered around its creator, who goes by the alias Satoshi Nakamoto. The person known only by that name began this technical, technological revolution. And yet, even today, no one knows who he is. The Bitcoin white paper, which is the document that outlines the ideas of the currency, was published under Nakamoto's name on October 31st, 2008. And Bitcoin was released as open source code in January of 2009. After release as open source code, Nakamoto started the Bitcoin revolution by mining the first block, known as the Genesis block, and in doing so, embedded a message in the first ever Bitcoin block that reads, the times 03, Jan 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. This references a The Times newspaper heading, generally interpreted as both a timestamp for the beginning of Bitcoin and an insult to the instability of traditional banking systems. Another important piece of Bitcoin's history is the first commercial transaction made with Bitcoin, when a programmer by the name of Laszlo Hanyekov bought two pizzas from Papa John's Pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin, which if Laszlo had held his Bitcoin to the current day, would be worth $687 million. Bitcoin is built on a system called a blockchain, which is a type of database that uses encoded blocks that are linked together. They are chained using encoded data from the previous block making each and every block unchangeable, hence the name blockchain. The goal of Bitcoin, as well as blockchain technology as a whole, is to be able to trust a decentralized system, all while trusting no one using it. That's where a fundamental idea of Bitcoin, called proof of work, comes in. Proof of work is how blocks are validated by saying that whoever has put the most energy into this block and solving it 
is the person that can be trusted. Using a one-way cryptographic function called SHA-256, the block is hashed into a string of characters, and using a random number in front of the block allows for the generation of completely different hashes. The network then looks for a predefined number of zeros in front of the hash. This forms the basis for all of Bitcoin's transactions, as it requires a massive amount of computing power to find a correct hash with the correct number of zeros. Another fundamental part of Bitcoin is called difficulty, which automatically adjusts how many zeros need to be in front of the hash to try to get the entire network to solve a block approximately every eight to 10 minutes. If it gets too difficult, the difficulty is reduced. And if it gets too easy, it's increased. Bitcoin is also limited to 21 million Bitcoin, unlike traditional banks, and that limit cannot be surpassed. However, even with this limit, Bitcoin will always stay relevant because of another aspect of blockchain. Much like a regular database, blocks contain records of the transactions made with Bitcoin, but with limited amounts of space. This makes it so that to have a valid transaction, you have to wait for your transaction to be put on a block and validated. To make this process faster, you can pay a higher transaction fee, which goes out to the people validating the blocks, which entices them to put your transaction on a block faster. This means that when Bitcoin runs out, transaction fees will keep Bitcoin flowing. Recently, there have been many cutting edge technologies developed around Bitcoin. One of the greatest new applications of Bitcoin has been by a company called Upstream Data, who use Bitcoin to solve the major issue of stranded gas from oil field sites being vented into the atmosphere or burned. There's also no need for long pipelines or any sort of gas transportation. How? They use the natural gas locally on the sites as fuel for an engine and use the energy produced to mine Bitcoin, not only reducing carbon emissions by a massive amount, but also incentivizing the reduction with the added bonus of Bitcoin for the energy that would otherwise be wasted. For all of you here, I hope you have gained a newfound knowledge of Bitcoin through this very simplified introduction, as well as an interest in the technology and ideas surrounding it. I would encourage everyone to do more research on their own. Finally, I will leave you with a saying from the Bitcoin world, hodl to the moon, a joke meaning to hold on for dear life to your Bitcoin until prices reach the moon. Thanks, speaker number four. Now we'll just give the judges a few minutes to mark. Speaker well, five, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, we have speaker number five. Topic is, what have you learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? What have you learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? Speaker number five. English author A.A. A. Milne once said, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, smarter than you think, and loved more than you'll ever know. We've all learned things over the past year about this virus, about ourselves, and about the world. But what have I personally learned? Well, I think in order to understand that, you need to know how it all went for me. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Flight Sergeant Sinead Barnes. I'm a member of the 675 Bow Valley Air Cadet Squadron, and today I'm going to tell you what I have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. If plan A doesn't work, the alphabet has 25 more letters. 204 if you're in Japan. This quote from Claire Cook definitely describes how my 2020 went. It started with my grade 10 school year taking a twist no one expected when school was shut down in March and moved to online in April. Having to learn and adapt to the lifestyle of online schooling was interesting. For me, it wasn't that hard, mostly because I wasn't the only one. All of my friends and classmates had to get the hang of it as well, so everyone was at the same level of confusion. It was mostly just weird because I got to attend my accounting class in my pajamas, drinking coffee, and cuddling up with my cat. 
I learned that we can all adapt to new circumstances when we have to. On top of school being shut down and everyone having to stay in their homes like is World War III, my cadet squadron also got shut down, which for me was the hardest part about this past year. Cadets is such a big part of my life and has been for years. So when my captain announced in March that the 675 Bow Valley Air Cadet Squadron was on stand down until further notice, I was crushed. I remember standing in my kitchen that afternoon, hearing the notification pop up on my phone, seeing that it was about cadets and getting a little excited because maybe they found a way for us to continue with cadets. Maybe we were given some special treatment for some reason. But that thought didn't last long. My heart dropped to my stomach as I realized that that probably wasn't the case. But I couldn't be sure unless I checked the notification. So I took a deep breath, picked up my phone, got into Facebook and read the words I had been dreading, stand down. Now, those words may not seem so scary now, but they kept appearing. At first, it was until April 1st, then April 30th, and then it became September, which meant I wouldn't be attending cadets for about six months, half a year. I realized how much my life changes when cadets isn't a part of it. So first, it was school. Then it was cadets. I thought this can't possibly get any worse, right? wrong. Because in the months leading up to summer, it was questionable whether the cadet summer training camps were still set to happen. And that was one of my last hopes. If I can't go to school, or cadets, or even the grocery store, I might still be able to go to camp. Unfortunately, by the time June rolled around and we could see that the case numbers in Canada weren't going down, the Air Cadet League made a national announcement that there would be no summer training courses. So, there goes my last hope. My last hope in a normal summer. My last hope at seeing some of my camp friends again. Now, although my summer wasn't what I thought it was going to be, and although I was disappointed that I wouldn't be attending camp, I was still able to spend a nice summer at home with my family. My brother and sister came home from university. We celebrated four birthdays in the summer months, and I was even, even able to have a few friends over for my 16th birthday. When things started opening up again, it was nice to start going places safely and taking small road trips to visit places like Rosh Percy. It was nice to start seeing people other than my annoying brother and sister, but we still made time to have fun as a family. Our local swimming pool was open for the summer, so following COVID guidelines, we were able to add some normality into our lives by going to the pool. That brings us to fall. The students at my school were given the option to continue online schooling or go back in person wearing masks. I personally couldn't take any more online school, so I took the option of in-person classes, and I'm glad I did. I learn and work so much better in a school environment, and I was thankful to see my friends again. So what have I really learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, other than the fact that my face is surprisingly small and doesn't fit well in most masks? Well, I've learned that we are all able to adapt to new and confusing circumstances, that school can be difficult when you're not in a classroom and is easier in person, that cadets is one of the most important programs in my life and I have very little to do when it isn't a part of my life. And I've learned that I love my friends and family. Over this past year, I've worried so much about my family and friends who live in provinces that have high case numbers. This pandemic has taught us so many things, from how to wear a mask properly, to how hard it can be to actually stay in your homes for months at a time. We've seen a lot of division with people's opinions varying widely. I think the most important thing I've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic can be summed up in this quote from Taylor Swift. No matter what happens in life, be good to people. Being good to people is a wonderful legacy to leave behind. Thank you. Thanks, Speaker 5. Now we'll just give the judges a few minutes. Speaker 6, are you ready? Yes. Okay, we have speaker number 6. Topic is cadet choice, specifically cadet life. Cadet life, speaker number 6. Stephen Covey once said, 
I am not a product of my circumstances. I'm a product of my decisions. Hello, I'm Emma Turney, and I'm from number 40 Snowbird Squadron in Moose Jaw. And today I'll be talking about cadet life. In my opinion, this quote means that it doesn't matter what life throws your way. It's how you deal with it that really matters. If you choose to give up or if you choose to seize the day. Little did I know, September 2016, I made one of the biggest decisions of my life. I decided to join the cadet program. My time in cadets has been nothing but exciting from day one. So today, I want to share cadets from my point of view. Throughout my years in cadets, I've gone through three stages. The nervous newbie, a beginner, and a leader. Stage one, newbie. I remember the exact moment I became acquainted with the cadet program. It was after I grabbed a brochure for air cadets from sidewalk days. I came home and I told my parents that I was going to join cadets and that I was going to be a pilot. But suddenly, a few weeks before the first cadet night, I was extremely nervous and I wasn't sure if I wanted to join anymore. You see, I was very awkward and not confident at all at this point. I had trouble making new friends because of it. My mom even told me she'd give me something if I tried to make friends at cadets. But to this day, I have completely forgotten about what she promised me. Because as soon as I joined cadets, started making friends, and started to feel a whole new belonging I never felt before, it just didn't matter what she promised me anymore. Everyone was so welcoming, and it really made me want to join. The first thing the cadet program helped me with was becoming more comfortable and confident with myself and helping my social skills. Stage two, beginner. This stage is where I learned how to be a follower. I didn't realize at this point, but this is the most important stage. This is the watching stage. I remember watching the senior cadets very closely because I was so excited to be like them when I was their age. I looked at what I liked and what I didn't like, and this helped me decide how I wanted to be. This is when I learned how to talk to people. This is when my confidence began to blossom. I learned new things every time I was at cadets, whether it was drill or aviation or citizenship or so many other things. But I was very intimidated when I came to this part of cadets because it's constant learning, which inevitably leads to mistakes. Along the way, I have made many, many mistakes, but I didn't take them for granted. I used them to learn and grow. I was also intimidated because this is when cadets teaches you to become independent. For me, independence was in my uniform. I took a lot of pride in my uniform and it's something I had to learn to do on my own and work for it. At the end of the day, it pays off. I feel confident and proud that all my work is shown. Another way cadets taught me independence was through going away on trips. Being away from your family that long can be hard for some, but we don't even realize it's teaching us a very valuable lesson and helping us grow. The second stage of cadets teaches us lessons and helps us shape into confident, independent, and well-rounded people. Stage three, leader. People join cadets for various reasons. As I said before, my reason was to become a pilot. But as I keep going through cadets, I realize that I've set new goals and I'm getting so much more out of this experience than I thought I would. I've learned how to be the new kid and a follower, but now it's time for me to lead the cadets. I have been nothing but scared for this phase from the first time I joined cadets. I have to care for others. While that is a huge honor, it's also a very big responsibility. I've taken all I've learned from other seniors and applied it to being a leader myself. Leading the cadets has been a struggle during this pandemic. Finding ways to keep the cadets engaged online has been difficult. This new normal is very hard for everyone, but we're getting through it all together. I hope we can be back together next year. Cadets is a huge part of my life and being able to pass that down to others is incredibly important to me. As a leader, I must also be a follower, a listener, and a teacher. I'm still learning and I'm excited to grow as I keep going. Throughout stages one, two, and three, I have changed a lot. As a new cadet, I learned to grow my social skills. As a beginner, I learned from my mistakes and paid attention to other seniors. Now I'm beginning my leading leading stage and I'm super excited to start. My confidence is much higher. I've made so many new friends and I've learned a lot along the way. 
I've never felt a belonging like this, and I'm so glad I made the decision to put myself out there and join cadets. I've changed in all the best way possible. I've matured and grew up with the cadet program, and I'm glad that I did. But don't go thinking that this is the end of my story. This is barely even the beginning. Thank you. Thanks, speaker number six. So that was the last prepared speech. So we'll give the judges a few minutes to mark. And let's take a little bit of a break before we start the impromptu portion. So it's just before two o'clock right now. And let's meet again at around 2.10. So just over 10 minutes for a break. So I'll see you all then. Okay, perfect. So now comes the impromptu speeches. So what we'll do is similar to the zone competition, we'll ask all the speakers to join a breakout room that Michelle will invite you all to. And the rest of the people, including judges, we can stay in this room. Okay, so all the speakers uh, are in a separate room. So what we'll do now is we'll be moving the speakers uh, when it's their time to a separate room. We'll be giving them the impromptu topic. They'll have three minutes to prepare. And then when they're done that preparation period, they'll join us in this room and give a two to three minute speech. And just a reminder for the judges, we're going to start with speaker number six. Okay, speaker number six has joined the preparation area. So in three minutes, we'll be starting our first impromptu speech. Okay, with a few minutes to go. So the impromptu topic this year for this competition will be how social media makes my life better or worse. So if you're living in the same household, I request that you please don't tell uh, the cadet, the, the speaker, just so we can make this competition fair for everybody. Speaker number six, are you ready? Yes. Okay, uh, you can start anytime. The question was, how has social media made my life better or worse? Today, I'm gonna to be talking about how social media has made my life better. We'll start out with the obvious. <laughs> During this pandemic, social media has been a huge help. Being able to keep in contact with my friends and being able to see their pictures online and see the outside world still and not just be trapped inside the, my house has been super amazing. And I don't know if I would have been able to get through the pandemic without that. It's a great way to keep in contact with people who don't live near you, like my grandma and my aunts and uncles, they don't live in Moose Jaw where I'm from. Another way it's helped me was through cadets. Cadets has been online since September because of the pandemic. So we've had to find interesting and new ways to keep the cadets engaged in the program, whether that's through online games such as Jeopardy or Kahoot, or if it's through a slideshow, or if it's just through talking to them on Discord, my squadron is using Discord to teach the classes. It's been an excellent way to keep in touch with the cadets. And I don't know if we'd be able to keep the cadet program going this year without online. Uh, and then another way it's helped me was to, it was in school. In school, it's helped me in two ways. One was when we had to go online twice this year because of the pandemic, of course. And another is through things like Google Classroom, where we can get assignments and submit assignments to our teachers very quickly and very easily. As everyone knows, the internet has been crucial during the pandemic. And I think we're all very thankful to have it especially these past two years. It's a great way to keep in touch with friends and family. And I'm very thankful that we have it. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, speaker number six. We'll give the judges a few minutes to mark. Speaker five, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Okay, you can start anytime. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, my name is Flight Sergeant Sinead Barnes. I'm a member of the 675 Bow Valley Air Cadet Squadron. And the topic that I was given is how social media makes my life better or worse. Now, this could go either way, but for me, I chose the better side of it. Social media makes my life better because I get to connect with my friends and my family anywhere, anytime. Really, all you need is a wife is Wi-Fi. I have a lot of friends who live across Canada and some across the globe, and same with family. So it's nice to be able to connect with them whenever I can. Another reason social media makes my life better is it's another way to get news. It's a very good news outlet, especially now there are very few places that still print newspapers. And my town is one of the places that has discontinued printing newspapers. So if I wanna get the news, even in my small town, online is the way to go. Especially during COVID, social media has allowed us to connect with the world and get, in the, get the information we need as quickly as possible. Now, with that comes some downfalls. There's some misinformation and confusion, but at least we're still getting the information. Connecting with people during the pandemic is one of the only ways to see and hear from people. Even right now, we are still continuing this effective speaking competition over Zoom. So, Social media has made my life better by allowing me to connect with friends and family wherever and whenever, by giving me a, a news outlet, and by allowing me to stay connected with everyone and anything during COVID. Thank you. Thank you, speaker number five. And we'll give the judges a few minutes. Speaker number four, are you ready? Uh, just give me a moment to pin the timekeeper and then I'm good to go. Sure. Awesome. Just got it? Yep. Okay, you can start any time. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, and esteemed judges. I am Warrant Officer Second Class Brett Rowan of 186 Lloydminster Air Cadets. And I believe social media is both a blessing and a curse in our world of technology today. I believe that the rise of social media can be both a blessing on a, and a curse on so many levels. New technology, such as Instagram, Facebook, even the platform we're on today, Zoom, makes communication easier than ever, making for the rapid diffusion of knowledge between cultures all around the world countries all around the world, and nations all around the world. But the detriment of social media is that it can be used easily to spread fake knowledge. Overall, I believe that we should take social media as a blessing, especially with the recent circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many, many new improvements to social medias have come out this year due directly and indirectly to the COVID-19 pandemic. And many of us have been forced to watch the world through a lens of social media. Many of us have been forced into our homes to online meetings, online cadets, online social gatherings. And we're expected to keep as far away from other humans as humanly possible. However, I think social media has greatly reduced the strain of this anxious, anxious separation. I think being able to communicate with people over your phone, your computer, over your internet has been a massive help to many people who would have otherwise struggled with this dire situation. On top of that, I think it has been massively beneficial that the governments of the world have been able to communicate with both each other and their citizens and communities, allowing for us to gain knowledge on 
what exactly is going on in the world that we live in today, even when it may be tough to discern what you're going to be doing next month, next year, where we'll be. So overall, I think the benefits of social media far outweigh any negative effects that it could possibly have in today's world. And I think that the benefits only get stronger as the world continues to change. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Four. And we'll give the judges a few minutes. Okay, Speaker Three, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, you can start anytime. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Flight Sergeant Kwan from 41 Hercules Squadron in Regina. And today I'll be sharing how social media makes my life better or worse. To start off, I'll talk about the pros of social media. Firstly, you can grow your network. And per I personally have been trying to grow my network through LinkedIn and trying to connect with others that I have been inspired by. And through that builds opportunities for me, for example, going to attending a startup camp that I never would have experienced without the use of social media. And secondly, I get to connect with people all over the world. And that's something you can't get without different social media platforms, whether it's through Instagram or LinkedIn, Facebook, or any of the social media platforms that are up there. And thirdly, you get experiences that you would never have imagined. So as I've mentioned, I am a part of a entrepreneurship camp where I am creating a startup to help high school students reach their health goals through a fitness mentor. And that has been offered through social media and without social media, I would not have had that opportunity. And now let's talk about the cons of social media. Social media has a lot of drawbacks as anyone anywhere can post anything that they want. And that often leads to lies or rumors that spread and people start believing them, which can create negative outcomes. And social media can also be a very dangerous platform where people may not have a way of getting out and whatever you post on there stays. And social media can also ruin some people's careers. If they posted something bad, they jobs would not hire them to be a part of the job that they're working for. So in conclusion, although there are bad pros and cons to social media, I Think that it's better for me as I positively use social media to share my voice, to connect with others across the world, and to have opportunities like I've never imagined before. Thank you. Thanks, speaker number three. And we'll give the judges a few minutes. Speaker number two, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, you can start anytime. How does social media make my life better or worse? Once again, good afternoon, honorable judges, officers, cadets, and guests. I am Warren Officer Catherine Patani with 542 Foam Link. Social media makes my life better in many ways. Some of those ways are connecting with people from across the globe. This year, taking my schooling online, I have met people from many different parts of the world and even participated in some group projects with them. One of the examples that comes to my mind is my friend Dana, who is from Egypt. Although we live in two very different time zones, we completed a project together and had to adjust our schedules accordingly. And now we keep in contact through so social media. Another way that I enjoy using social media, and it makes my life better, is to keep in contact with family. This has become 
very important, especially since the pandemic began. Another way that social media helps me stay in contact is with cadet friends. I have friends that I've met through cadet camps, through national cadet camps all across Canada. At one time in cadets, you would just have to say goodbye and hope to see each other at a different camp. Now we can stay in contact. We can share different teaching techniques as we become senior cadets and leaders within our squadron and even talk about the camps that we wish to attend or staff. Another way that social media positively impacts my life is we see different cultures and different ways of life on social media. Every person is different. And in Canada, we're very lucky to have a unique mosaic of people from around the globe. But with so social media, we can further advance what we see of those cultures, whether it's um, traditional dance or foods. In one way that social media negatively affects my life is it, it is very addicting. And because we only post the very best of our lives on social media, it can be deceiving. So in closing, social media positively impacts my life in many ways by connecting with friends and seeing different ways of life, but it also has negative aspects. Thank you. Thank you, speaker two, and we'll give the judges a few minutes. Speaker number one, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, you can start at any time. A lot of people in our world view the world as black or white, good or bad, right and wrong. There's no in-between, there's no gray area. But the reality is that many things in our life have some gray area. The topic I was given today is how has social media made my life better or worse? And the, real the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, is that social media has made my life better and worse. It's done both. And so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. I'm going to give you the good points of social media and the bad points of social media. So let's start off with the good. Well, social media is a really incredible tool. It connects us between each other. We can make friends online. We can see new people. We can find new viewpoints. And that's truly a gift that my generation has. We have something that no other generation before has ever had the opportunity to have, which is to talk to anyone from around the world. Also, there's a lot of really great education that can come from online. It can come from Khan Academy or online classes, learning even at home when we don't have a teacher right there in front of us to teach us. There's a wealth of information online at our fingertips that we just need to reach out and grab. I'm very interested in fitness. I've really been working hard to improve my fitness. And there's so many great resources out there to teach me and help me learn and set me on the right path to meet my goals. However, as with everything, we know that social media has some bad parts to it. Social media can really consume our lives. We can make these lives on social media that we try and make into this perfect little uh, avatar of ourselves, this false representation of ourselves. And we put so much stock into how other people treat those, those fake parts of ourselves. And, and we, we really hold that onto ourselves and we connect to it. And it can be really addicting and very damaging to our mental health. Also, when we're online, we're completely anonymous. It's very hard to people to know, for people to know who we are. And so it allows us to be cruel and horrible to each other with no repercussions coming back to ourselves in the real life. It is clear that social media has no clear right or wrong, good or bad, whether it impacts you or my life uh, in a beneficial or negative way. It does both. So the lesson to take away here is that we need to use social media as well as many other things with moderation and with caution making sure that we use it in the best way possible to make our lives the happiest that we can make it. Thank you. Thanks, Speaker One. We'll give the judges a few minutes to mark. 
So while the judges are doing that, they'll be also sending it to uh, Leslie to compile all the marks so we know uh, the results. So while that's happening, let's take a few minutes break and then we'll meet up again at let's say three o'clock and we'll go through cadet introductions, judge introductions and the presentations. So I'll see you all at three. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, like last time, let's just go and go around introducing ourselves. So speaker number one, you can start, maybe introduce uh, your name, your squadron, and a fun fact about you, something that you enjoy or just something that we should know about you. It's like you're making me do another impromptu speech. Jeez, I thought I was done. Um, so uh, my name is Sergeant Mike Shields. I'm with, I live in Shawnee, Saskatchewan, but my squadron is 605 Terry Squadron. Um, I guess a fun fact about me that would be cadet related would be that I'm, 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 I'm a drill nut. I like drill, um, which a lot of cadets don't like, but for some reason I seem to enjoy it. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Speaker two. Hello, I am Warren Officer First Class, Catherine Batani. I'm with 542 uh, in Foam Lake. And a fun fact about me is that my absolute favorite color is blue. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, speaker three. Hello, everyone. I am Flight Sergeant Kwan. I am from Ituna, Saskatchewan, but I go to 41 Hercules Squadron in Regina. And a fun fact about me is that I play running back in football. Nice. Speaker four. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Warnester Second Class Rowan from 186 Lloydminster Air Cadets. Um, and I guess a fun fact about me would be that I play the bagpipes, making me the most annoying person in a 30 kilometer radius. Good to know that I'll stay away from you <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Speaker number five. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Flight Sergeant Sinead Barnes. I'm from the 675 Bull Valley Air Cadet Squadron in Oxbow, Saskatchewan. And I am the drum major of my small little squadron, and I have been for about three years. Perfect. And speaker number six. I'm Flight Sergeant Cherney from number 40 Snowbird Squadron in Moose Jaw. Um, a fun fact about myself is that my favorite hobby is singing and playing instruments. Nice. Well, congrats to all of you for making it to the provincials. Um, I don't know what the results are, but I think your speeches were well done for both speeches. Uh, now, I'd just like to introduce the judges. So if you could all just uh, turn on your webcam. Uh, let's start with judge one. I'll introduce you and then maybe you can say a few words afterwards. Uh, maybe, do you want to just say hi so we can pin your screen so you know what you look like? Um. That, that's good. Yeah, we can, we can see you now. Um, so Judge 1 is uh, Steve uh, Burgess, who was a cadet at 34 Sabre Squadron in Regina from 1987 through to 1992. He attended junior leader, junior leader course as well as senior leader course or he won the annual effective speaking competition in 1990. He was a staff cadet at Penhold in 1991 and attained the rank of Warrant Officer Second Class before leaving the squadron. Steve now lives in Utah with his wife and six children and works in the construction and insurance industry and is an aspiring podcaster. Uh, thanks for the help, Steve. Uh, do you wanna say a few words? Oh, there we go. Yeah, no, it was, it was a great, uh, great presentations by everybody. Really impressive, um, fun stuff. Took me back to uh, 30, 4, 25 years ago, too long. But uh, yeah, just happy to be involved and, uh, and thought, thought you all did a, did a really excellent job. Awesome, thanks, Steve. Uh, for judge number two, we have Tanya Anselmo. Uh, she's a mediator 
holding a Master of Arts in International Conflict Management. She's worked as a youth representative for the United Nations Association in Edmonton, a human rights officer with the Alberta Human Rights Commission, and is now on family leave from her position within the Government of Canada as a foreign worker program officer. Tanya was a former Air Cadet from 1992 to 1999 with 395 Squadron in Edmonton and staffed many summers at the Senior Leadership Course in Cold Lake, Alberta. Tanya has fond memories of participating in the effective speaking competition and understands how terrifying it, it can be and wishes every candidate courage, confidence, and a clear path forward. Thanks, Tanya. And do you want to say a few words? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I thought it was uh, quite excellent. It was really nice to hear everyone. And uh, I almost thought you guys did better. You all did better uh, with the impromptu, which is nice because it really shows that that's what a good speaker is, you know, how you can think on your feet and it's more relatable to real life. So it was excellent just even seeing your, your emotion in that. Um, and I just want you all to know that, you know, being a judge, it's really easy to be critical and say, oh, you know, this point wasn't accurate and that point wasn't accurate. But um, just doing this and having the confidence to go through um, a competition like this, it just, it's so nice to see. And you all did such a, a really amazing job. Um, great attitudes from everyone. And uh, it's, it's just exciting to see the youth of the future. Thanks, Tanya. And for judge number three, we have Joe Merhofer, who is a lifelong resident of the Regina area. Uh, he's been working and raising his family there and has made his career in the information technology sector. Joe subscribes to the importance of education and effective speaking, and as an alumnus, was a member of the University of Regina Senate. Joe has been a volunteer with 41 Hercules Squadron, assisting in a number of fundraising events. Uh, thanks, Joe. Do you want to say a few words? I sure do. Uh, this is my first exposure to this uh, effective speaking uh, competition, and I am really quite astounded at the caliber of the participants. You all did uh, a very good job. And for me being new to this, it was extremely hard. And uh, I have to commend you, uh, all of you, because you did a very good job. And thank you for that. Thanks, Joe. And now, uh, Leslie, if you, do you have a few minutes, if you'd like to say something? Sorry for putting you on the spot. Okay, I am still, uh, I am the tally person. So I, um, I just finished inputting everything, but um, I hope you all understand that I, I really want to double check and triple check the number. So uh, I will need a couple more minutes with that. But um, uh, while uh, I can take a break for a quick second, I appreciate the judges taking their time out to, to do this, uh, their time and their expertise and all of the volunteers. I really appreciate the cadets for participating in this activity and sharing your talents with us because it's just a, a pleasure to be able to listen to you all. Um, so thank you so much. Um, yeah, so thank you to, to everybody that uh, contributed to help make this event uh, success, our MC, our tech person, and uh, the SAS, uh, Saskatchewan Air Cadet League, um, and yes, especially the cadets for participating, because we can't have a competition if we don't have participants, so I encourage you all to keep participating, learning, growing, um, just not in this program is it going to help you, but just in life, so uh, like I say, it's a pleasure to, to watch you, so. Um, so that was Leslie Bennett, she uh, organized the effective speaking competitions, both of the zone competitions last weekend, and the provincial competition today. So thanks to Leslie uh, for all her help. So while we're waiting a few minutes, uh, Michelle, if you want, we could, we could have the judges talk to cadets right now, or we could wait until after. Okay, MCJ, can I put you on the spot? Sure. <laughs> Um, while we're waiting and some of the cadets are getting some feedback, um, Jay has been to nationals. Uh, can you tell us about your experience? Sure, I can. Um, I was at nationals for 2017 and 18. So that was in Winnipeg and Laval, Quebec. And the actual effective speaking competition is only for one of the evenings. 
the remaining time, which is it's a three or four day period, we're just with the remaining cadets and there's one per uh, province or territory. So there's 13 of us and we're just touring that area. So in Winnipeg, uh, we were touring like the Human Rights Museum uh, and some you know, military bases and there was an aerospace uh, company that we got to tour. So things like that, it's just so we know the city and the surrounding area. Um, and the actual competition itself, um, well, the effective speaking competition is a part of the annual general meeting uh, for the National Air Cadet League. So all of the representatives from all of the provinces and territories, from all the Air Cadet Leagues are there. So that's part of the audience. So there's about three to 400 people there from all the Air Cadet Leagues, plus the judges, plus some special guests from the military side um, or from Air Cadet squadrons. So it's a, it's a pretty nice, big competition uh, where you can meet a lot of people from across the country. And it feels like it is a national effective speaking competition because you're presenting to a large group and um, you're sequestered in a room. This, this year it'll be different because it's digital but you're normally sequestered in a room. Um, and and it's, it's nice just that transition from our squadron or zone or provincial competitions, which are usually 20 to 30 people to now this big competition. So it is big stakes, but uh, during the competition, uh, you know, all the people are there. Uh, all the people there are nice. <laughs> so it's not like you have to worry too, too much. Whoever gets to go there, um, I guess in the future when it's in person, uh, but it's a fun competition. It's a fun competition. We you get to meet a lot of people and you get to tour the area um, and see what's there. So it's especially fun if you've never been to that location before. Well, I, Leslie, I hope that was enough. That's what I came up with on the spot. <laughs> it wasn't two minutes. Oh. It wasn't two minutes. Oh no. <laughs> Well, good thing I, I don't. Good thing I don't have to compete this year, and I can just take a step back. Uh, no, it was great. Thanks. Appreciate your feedback, and I'm and I'm sure that the cadets will as well. Unfortunately, of course, they don't get to to go and tour somewhere this year. It will be um, uh, done virtually, um, but you still get the opportunity to uh, see other cadets that get to participate, and there'll be cash prizes this year. So that's something. That's something else. Oh, I didn't know that. Do you know what the cash prizes are? Uh, no. <laughs> um, no, I'm not 100% certain, so uh, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to say I uh, get it wrong, but um, yeah, but there will be something. Nice. Sounds like fun. Okay, I think all the judges and cadets are back. So I'd like to introduce Gary Gehring, who is the Saskatchewan Air Cadet League chairperson, to make the medal presentations and uh, make a few comments. Okay, I think I have uh, audio. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, another great job by our finalists today, I, I have to say. Hello, my, my name is Gary Gehring. I'm the uh, current chair for the league. As everyone probably knows, effective speaking is a league-driven activity, and like many things now, we've had to adjust to the virtual setting. My thanks uh, go to everyone who assisted in delivering the event today and to the cadets who participated. Uh, a special thank you to Leslie Bennett, who oversaw the effective speaking event for the league, and uh, a job well done, I must say. For me, these cadets are all winners because this important skill will help all of them in their future endeavors, whether it be for selection boards, job interviews, or a class assignment, these skills will serve them well. Being a competition, we have to select a winner to represent the Saskatchewan League at Nationals. And I uh, appreciate the work of the judges in quantifying these excellent speeches. Uh, uh, I appreciate, as, as we all do, the uh, work that goes into trying to quantify what you've seen today. Uh, I think it would have been uh, uh, a difficult job. 
So I'm pleased to present uh, the runners up from today. So for bronze, uh, Mark Shield, 605, Terry Swift Current. Congratulations. You will we'll receive a bronze medal. Uh, second place winner, Emma Cherney, Snowbird Moose Jaw, 40. Uh, you will receive a silver medal from your efforts today. Congratulations to both of you. Uh, good work. Our representative to the National Effective Speaking Competition for 2021 is uh, Catherine Battiani from Foam Lake. Uh, you will receive the gold medal from this provincial competition. Congratulations and an excellent job. You know, you now, or sorry, you know you will have our entire provincial league rooting for you at the national competition so you won't be alone all the speakers today will receive a certificate and silver pin from their efforts and again i think all the speakers are winners uh, on behalf of the air cadet league of saskatchewan thank you for attending and i think you've all seen 50 50 draw that ends in six days I think we're 2,300 or so. So uh, yeah, excellent, uh, appreciate it. And uh, back to you, Jay. Thanks, Gary. So yeah, just some closing comments. I'd like to thank Michelle, who's a tech support person. He set, a, he set everything up on Zoom and I think it worked pretty seamlessly. So thanks for that. Thanks to Leslie Bennett again for organizing this. Um, and also thanks to uh, everyone that joined, all the parents, all the judges that helped out, and all the uh, competitors especially. Um, to close out, Leslie, do you have a few comments? Uh, no, I, I think I said my piece earlier. Just congratulations again to all the cadets for participating. Please do keep participating and um, encouraging participation at your squadron and other squadrons. Um, we just know what a great uh, activity and skill uh, this is to have for now and in the future. I can't thank enough uh, my judges. It is a very, very difficult job and um, your time um, was, it, it was, a, it was a difficult job. So good job. Thank you um, for participating and uh, for my timekeeper and Leanne in the impromptu room giving the cadets their topic and, and to all the volunteers. Uh, JRMC and Michelle the Tech again. Just um, it takes a lot of of um, people to make this uh, a success, and we're really glad we were able to host something virtually this year. Um, and we're really happy to see that cadets um, still chose to participate, it, even though it was virtually. And uh, that is not a small thing. Like that's for you guys to take that on. It's just an added thing not to have a crowd and the virtual and the technology. And you just all did just a fantastic job. So just so proud of you all. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, so with that, that's the conclusion of the provincial competition. And thanks for joining today. Have a wonderful day.